We're now going to transition to our worship service, and we're going to do that with an incredible prayer of Good morning. No matter who you are, where you are on life's journey, you are welcome in this place as we celebrate the love of God. Amen. Let me also welcome everyone joining us from near and far uh, through Facebook and however else you do that here. I don't know, but um, it's great to have technology bring us together in ways that 10 years ago we wouldn't have even thought about. One of these, this day is one of uh, my family's favorite days because, uh, and my church's favorite day because they love a minister that preaches from a manuscript in my church, a New England congregationalist. And so they love it when Karen comes there. And uh, she said, and I don't know if it's true, she said, you preach more like a Baptist sometimes. And so my folks like you, like you once a year to come and preach. And so uh, greetings from the First Congregational Church of Essex Junction. We have a unique connection and uh, it's great to be here. I hear about you all all year long, just so you know. And so it's great to... Uh, Put names to faces. I'm still doing that because I'm terrible with names, but it's it's, it's very good to be here. Um, let us begin our worship service um, with the congregational intro. To turn your We have the 
a meal at a new place and that's the meal has been taken care of but they are still looking for uh smaller items that we could bring over which would be backpacks belts um gently used or new sizes 32 to 38 uh travel size shampoo and conditioner um and bath towels the larger items are three dresser drawers tvs 27 inch or smaller and pillows uh, that are the wipeable hospital grade if you bring any of the smaller items here dave and i will bring them over when we bring the meal thank you so let's resume the service with the call to worship Happy are those who walk in God's ways. Faithful are those whose eyes are fixed on righteousness. Come, let us love the Lord our God. Our opening hymn is We Have Come to Join in Worship, number 647.
Today, we, we are receiving a special offering for the relief experts in Turkey and Syria through one great hour of sharing. International Ministries is working with the European Baptist Federation and other partners to bring humanitarian aid in that region of the world. To contribute to one great hour of sharing to the ministries of First Baptist, you can give electronically through the Vanco Mobile Faith Engagement app through our website by sending a check to the church office, or for those of you here in this place, by placing your offering in the offering plate. For the earthquake quake relief, please write OGHS hyphen Turkey Syria earthquake relief in the memo line of your check. Karen wants you to do it just like that. Whether you are here or remote, your participation in our many ministries is deeply appreciated. Our many offerings will now be received.
It's now time for the boys and girls come forward for the children's message or young and heart. Good morning, my girls. Good morning, boys and girls. How are all of you today? My name is Reverend Mark. I am Reverend Karen's husband. And so uh, I like children's messages because children are great. I wanted to talk about something that's very important today. I wanted to talk about anger. Anybody ever get angry? I get angry. Oh, my goodness. Anybody ever get angry at your brother or sister? Do you get how about, do you ever get angry with your parents? Go to your room. Clean up. Do the dishes. You get angry at that? Stop playing. Sometimes. So is have all of you been angry at one time or another? Now, sometimes when you get angry, you like react and freak out, right? Anybody ever do that? It's sort of like this is this is a favorite part of the children's message. It's an old, old children's message. And I don't know how to do this. So anger, sometimes when it comes up, it gets all in and then it has to come. Has anybody ever had that happen? All of a sudden, your hate just happens to be like, oh, and so anger is sometimes like this. It just comes right, it just gets. Then you go, oh, I don't believe I, I broke the lamp. Now, let me ask you this once you realize that. Can you, can you get it back in? No. <laughs> Wait, let's try. Oh, that's bad. So when, once you once the anger comes out, you can't do anything about it. Can you? And so you know, God wants you to be careful with your anger. Anger sometimes can be bad, but sometimes it can be good. Like when I was young, I saw. A black kid getting picked on by the Rangers. And you know what? Same thing. And so, you know what I've done all my life? Try to break those barriers between black and black. And so, sometimes anger can make me do good things, but sometimes it can make me like do things you don't want to do, right? And so, there are a few tricks. And uh, one of them is this is a good one between husbands and wives. None of you are married, right? No. Okay. Well, sometimes they can work with brothers and sisters too. And this advice actually comes from the Apostle Paul. And Paul says, never let the sun go down on your anger. So some couples have this rule that you don't go to bed if you're angry with each other. Has anybody ever gone to bed angry? Come on, can you Yeah. Is it a good sleep? No, it's a terrible sleep. I mean, it's a terrible sleep. And you know another one that I think is good for kids? When you're really angry and you want to like hit your brother in the chin, don't do it. You know another good one? Anybody know another one? You go count ten. One. And usually you start back. One, two, three, four. Five. And then hopefully by ten, you go six, seven. And so sometimes counting to 10 lets the anger sort of dissipate and go away. And so it's a little trick you use, but Jesus wants you to check your hearts and your mind and your bits and your body to sort of control the anger inside and use it for good. If you're angry at your brother, what should you do? Should you hit him? Now, what should you do with him? Uh, a timeout. A timeout. Brother, I think you need a timeout. Or maybe go to your parents and your parents say, okay, each of you need a timeout. Right? And what else could you do? 
Maybe I know this is crazy. This is crazy. I know this is crazy. But maybe you could talk to your brother or sister or your parents and say, Oh, I'm favorite. No, no, no. And you know what your mom or dad would say? And then you have a discussion, and then you're not hitting your brother in the face. What if the talking is here? better than hitting? You got a question? What if the discussion gets out of hand then you're more angry? Hopefully your parents won't let the discussion get out of hand. And you know another you know another good rule? If you're angry and you think that's gonna happen, go for a walk. You know what my son used to do? He used to run for five miles. He'd go, he be angry. He'd say, I'm gonna go for a run. And he'd go and he'd go for a run and he'd come back. Oh, oh that's great. I feel so much better now. He totally forgot. So learn to control your anger a little bit. Otherwise, it's going to end up like this. And you don't want that. Okay. You can go to wherever you go to now. Thank you for coming with us. Yeah. I already know that. You already know that? Good for you. Okay, put this back. requests the response today is god of light and i say god of light and you say we lift our prayers to you you are familiar with this ancient tradition yes okay just just as a note i am a back and forth minister so i never ask rhetorical questions these are actual questions so you can actually respond when i ask so just for fun let us pray Gracious and most holy God, thank you for calling us to this place. Thank you for the stillness that turns our hearts to you. Thank you for your presence that meets us here and meets us as we go home and welcomes us home and meets us in our places of work and at school and wherever we go. Thank you, God, for your spirit and your presence being an active and vibrant presence in this world and in our lives. We ask that you would give us eyes of discernment that we might be able to see you more clearly. We ask that you might be, that we might be able to see your spirit working in the midst of this church and her many ministries. We ask that you would give us eyes of discernment so that we can see the spirit of God and the people around us, even the people we don't like. For you are within all of us, and every single person in this room is a precious child of God. Dear God, we ask that you would allow us to take that theology and that statement out into the world so that everyone we meet on the street might have your imprint in them within our eyes. We ask that you would continue to bless this church with vision and with purpose. We ask that you would comfort and strengthen the faith of everyone in this room. We pray for this church, but we pray for all your churches where Jesus Christ is lifted up and his message of love is spread. But we also pray for other religious traditions and pray that you might lift up them so that all of us might make this world together and we might witness to the unity that you have in this world for all your children. Help us as Christians and Muslims and Jews and atheists all to come together to work for love and justice in this place. As much as we pray for ourselves, we also pray for the wider world where people are struggling from earthquakes and homelessness and addictions and geopolitical strife. 
We pray for folks who don't have a place to lay their heads, who have no nation to call home. We pray for immigrants. We remember that your people were once immigrants out of Egypt and into Egypt. Dear God, be with the war in the Ukraine. We ask that you would guard and guide your children there and keep the innocents safe. We ask that that war might end in a positive and good way to make the world a better place. We pray that your despots and your dictators and your megalomaniacs, and the people that enjoy power over others, might slowly diminish their hold upon us. We pray for economic systems that are unjust to slowly fail. We pray for a day and for policies where all your people are lifted up where people can be fed and clouds clothed and taken care of with dignity. Dear God, bless your church throughout this world. Bless all of us to your purpose and keep your love and your peace in our hearts so that we might be strong to face each day. And we pray this in the name and spirit of Jesus Christ, who taught us to say when praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And I forgot to do God of Light, so let's just do it once. God of Light. Beautiful. Now let us sing the next hymn, The Gift of Love, number 397.
The scripture today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the fifth chapter, verses 21 through 37. But I'm going to read it a little longer just because it's a great text and I wanted to include it. And ministers get to do that. So this is from the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. And first be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift to God. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on your way to court. With him or your accuser, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. And then you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members and for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members and for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard it said to those of ancient times, you shall not fair, swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say you do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. May God bless the reading and understanding of these sacred words. We are in the Gospel of Matthew in the lectionary. The lectionary has a three-year cycle where you focus on Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John is sort of mixed in a little bit. The Gospel of Matthew is written, uh, most scholars think, somewhere between 90 and 110 A.D. It's written, the key time is it's written after 70 A.D. And so the temple has been destroyed. And so there's certain issues that... Uh, come up within the church because of the destruction of the temple. So the people did not have the temple to go to. Therefore, the Pharisees helped shape the community and have people grounded in the law and in the Pharisaic tradition. And when the temple was destroyed, those two pillars of the faith became more important to them because they didn't have a church to go to. 
And so when they, when we hear difficult things about Pharisees in scripture, about Jesus taking them on, part of that is because they're in a time when the new things the disciples are talking about that Jesus taught them are butting heads with what the Pharisees are saying to keep the Jewish religion together. And so there's not a lot of unity between the early Christian movement and the Pharisees and the Jewish community. And the Gospel of Matthew has three sources to it. Uh, the first source of the Gospel of Matthew is the Gospel of Mark. All but 60 verses in the Gospel of Mark are in the Gospel of Matthew. Actually, almost all of Mark is in Matthew. And then you have this other resource that is called Q. It's German for quell, and it means source. And they know that they have this because there are times when Matthew and Luke separate and uh, go off in a different direction from the Gospel of Mark, but they do it with the same exact story. And so they realized after a thousand years or more that that meant there was another source out there that the two of them had that the gospel of Mark didn't have. And so Matthew has all of Mark. It has this Q source. And then there's some material that is just unique to the gospel of Matthew that Matthew said, oh, I remember that. And so put that down. So Matthew consists of these three sources. It was probably written by the disciple that was a tax collector, but we're not sure. Nobody really knows. The gospel itself entitled Matthew wasn't there until long after it was written. Matthew specifically means gifts of God. And I hate to tell you this, but Matthew was always listed about seventh or eighth in the disciples list. So he wasn't the inner circle. He wasn't the top tier disciple. I hate to tell you that, but he wrote a great gospel that we have now. We don't even know much about Nathaniel, but Matthew we know about because he wrote this gospel. And it was probably uh, written to a Jewish community in Syrian Antioch because there's a lot of uh, Jewish connotations in the Gospel of Matthew, more than any of the other Gospels. And so Matthew starts with the genealogies tracking Jesus to Abraham and to David. And so Jesus is connected to those streams within Scripture. But within the first five chapters of Matthew, he also quotes Isaiah and Hosea. And he says that uh, Jesus is a little bit like Moses because he goes to Egypt as an immigrant. Like the, like the people in the Exodus story. So he quotes that, he quotes Exodus and Genesis. He quotes first and second Kings, Zechariah, Leviticus, Enoch. Uh, he talks about the dove at the baptism, which harkens back to the ark. He quotes Psalms, Deuteronomy, Maccabees, Nehemiah, and Numbers. And all of that is in the first five chapters of the Gospel of Matthew. So he wants the Jewishness of Jesus to be known and to come out in the community. Matthew is sort of overlaying Christ's message over the Old Testament message and comparing Jesus to the significant characters in the Old Testament, to Moses, to Abraham, to David, to Elijah, and to the Messiah. Today's text is a perfect example of that because it's the Sermon on the Mount. Anybody remember a great Sermon on a Mount that came from the Old Testament that had these things that you're supposed to live by? Ten Commandments, right? Up on Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb. And so Matthew is trying to compare Jesus to Moses with the giving of the Ten Commandments. Isn't that, did you know that? And so Jesus and Matthew are making comparisons between the Beatitudes and the Ten Commandments, the laws by which we live. It's interesting that right after verse 17, um, there, it says this. So you have uh, 1 through 16, which is the uh, 17, which is the, uh, the Beatitudes that you're familiar with. And then this is part of the uh, text today is part of the later on in that sermon. But in between, he says this, 
Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until it is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of God. So even though the the Beatitudes seem completely different from the Ten Commandments, Jesus is saying they are a fulfillment of the Ten Commandments. They're saying the same thing in a different way, which is strange because they sound very different. The theologian David Dalby highlighted a well-known rabbinic convention that compares and contrasts what is written with what is spoken. And this text is a perfect illustration of that. So he says, you have heard it said, like in the old days, it was written down in the law, like, uh, and it is, is rigid and inadequate, and it's stuck in time and space. But then it says, but I say to you, and so this con- rabbinic tradition, this rabbinic convention then has a person who says, but I say to you, being the one who is creative and is interpreting the law to a new day and age that is better than the old. And so he says that that's exactly what Jesus is doing here. Christ in the Sermon on the Mount is not rejecting the law, but trying to figure out how to make the law live in people's lives again. How to move the law away from the Pharisees and scribes and the Jewish leader who used it to control people and determine who has the proper relationship to God in society and who doesn't. And they used it to maintain their own position and keep money in the hands of a few. Can you imagine people writing the law to benefit themselves? Well, that's what the Pharisees and scribes and the Jewish leaders were doing with the Ten Commandments. The law was broken and Jesus was trying to bring it back to life. So it becomes a means of God's grace again, a way in which we can live in peace with our God and neighbor and everyone we come in contact with. To have the law draw people joyfully to God and not be separated. The Jewish leaders turned the law on its head and used it for its own purposes and drove a wedge between God and humanity. And Jesus was furious about that. How many of you feel guilty because you've broken one of the Ten Commandments and you just can't get past it? It seems like a barrier to God, a barrier to your relationship to the divine entity. I don't know about you, but sometimes that happens to me. I do something I'm not supposed to do and I don't feel as if I'm right with God. And the Jews said, aha, now you have to sacrifice and give a little to the church to be made right with God. So you can either double your pledge or you can change your theology. I'll leave that up to you. But let's take a quick look at the two because uh, they're different. And I'm not sure if you remember the Ten Commandments. From Exodus 20, I am the Lord. I'm going to read fast because you know this. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth below or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land of the Lord your God. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not cover your neighbor's house or you shall not cover your neighbor's wife or make male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. I love the Ten Commandments. They're so easy and they're ten. 
Like it's, it's easy to remember them. Four of them concern our relationship with how we know and relate to God. And six are concerned with how we relate to each other. They're simple, they're direct and to the point. They're pretty easy to understand. Anybody have any problems with understanding any of those commandments? No, of course not. Now, let me ask you this. Who tries to follow them? Really, raise your hand. Who tries to follow the Ten Commandments? Okay, some of them. What? Eight, eight, eight about like that? No, I'm kidding. So, so that's good. We all try to follow the Ten Commandments. Now, let's compare that to the Beatitudes. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. After he sat down, his disciples came to him. Came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but it's thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but puts it on a lampstand and gives light to the whole house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Who loves to follow the Beatitudes? Y'all do. They're different, though, aren't they? Aren't they a little different? Okay, nah, I'll do something. Yeah, yeah. They're a little different. It doesn't seem to have specific behaviors. And personally, I like it easy. These are different in nature from the Ten Commandments. They're different genres. The Ten Commandments come from the Deuteronomic editor, and the Beatitudes come from the wisdom tradition in Scripture. There doesn't seem to be clear, concise behavioral commands, but instead they're grounded in ways of being. Being poor in spirit, people who are mourning, people who are meek, people who are hungry for what's right, people who are merciful or have pure hearts or are peacemakers or stand up for what's right or suffer at the hands of other people who are salt and light. Jesus is concerned not just about whether you follow the jots and tittles of the law, but Jesus is concerned about your motives and your attitudes. Jesus wants you to live by the highest principles of life and not just follow blindly the law in which we live under. Jesus shifts the law from the negative goal of avoiding sin and judgment to the positive goal of welcoming God into your heart and letting that relationship emanate out in every single aspect of your life. Jesus also substitutes an obtainable and definable set of regulations, the Ten Commandments, they're easy, with an open-ended ideal we never completely reach. It's a perfection that is talked about in today's scripture. But instead of obtaining and getting to all ten that you don't do like the Pharisees and scribes, they could do that. But instead, the Beatitudes have us always striving, always yearning to be better people, always working to create a better society. In scripture and in tradition, we call this sanctification. Sanctification, slowly becoming saints. And you know what? We never get there. We just strive all our life. Is anybody too old? No, you strive until you die. And so the Beatitudes talk about this sanctification. We're always getting better. We're always striving. Where the Pharisees and scribes could say, yep, I follow all ten. I'm right with the Lord. I can do anything I want. While they were corrupting the spirit of the law. 
You see the difference between the two? And that's why Matthew and Jesus says that your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and scribes. When you lean into the Beatitudes, when you slowly shape your internal being to align with the Sermon on the Mount, then you will easily be able to follow the Ten Commandments. You have heard it said, and then, and then there are six areas in today's text. Oh, boy. I hope nobody has lunch, lunch plans. So the scripture text today, thank you for laughing at my joke. Um, the six areas of the text today uh, talk about different things. It says, you have heard it said that you shall not murder, but I say, do not be angry with your brothers and sisters. Do not call them stupid or a fool. Now, it's easy not to murder, but it's hard to shift your thinking to love your neighbor as yourself and quit putting others down and diminishing their spirit. See how much harder that is than just not murdering somebody? Jesus said that you, you can't worship and praise God and offer sacrifice unless you are reconciled to your brothers and sisters in faith. So go and make it right, because you can't worship God if you're at odds with somebody out here. If you're at odds with, with your brother or sister or your neighbor or somebody like that, how can you worship God when that is going on inside of your heart? And you know what's funny? If they would have to leave the temple, which is the only place they sacrifice, they would have had to have gone home. So it could have been miles. It could have been 7, 10, 20 miles that they'd have to leave their gift here and then go home and make it right and then come back. You have heard it said that you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, if you look in lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. Jesus is saying that your inner thoughts lead to behaviors. What you think in here comes out somehow. It affects how you act and how you live in this world. You must change the way you think and feel in here and in here. Because God does not want us objectifying others because of their body parts. And that's the whole thing about the eye and the hand and the ear. If you're going to objectify somebody over sex, why not just objectify them over the eye or over the hand? Why do you need all of that? And God is saying, no, you can't objectify anything. And that is much harder than just not committing adultery. Jesus says that you should not divorce. Jesus here and later, instead of arguing about the reasons for or against divorce, he says the whole, the whole underpinning of divorce is flawed because when God made us, God made us to last a lifetime. The intention of God is for us to be together forever. And so God wants relationships to be worked on. And in our society, and back then too, sometimes divorce comes too easily. The same with the vows and the oath. Jesus is essentially saying that if you have to promise that you are not lying, you've already betrayed your honesty. So there's something that my child does. Her, their name is Shay. And there's something that she does that drives me crazy. I'm not going to tell you what it is because that's her business. But I'll tell you this. It drives me crazy. And since she was about five, I would make her pinky promise that she would never do it again. You know, you get your kids right at the right time. Would you like pizza today? Well, how about a pinky promise that you won't do that? Oh, okay, Dad, I'll do that. And so I've had about 38 pinky promises that Shay would not do this particular action to me. And guess what? She still does. It drives me crazy. Instead, Jesus, instead of taking pinky promises and vows, Jesus just wants us to be honest all the time. If you have to say to your wife, oh, I promise, I didn't do that, I didn't do that, you're done, you're done already. And so that's the yes and yes and no and no. It's sort of like the boy who cried wolf. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say, do not resist an evildoer. If they strike you on the cheek, give him the other. If they sue you for a coat, give him a cloak also. If they make you walk a mile, go a second mile. Give to anyone who begs. Jesus is saying, break down the walls that divide us and keep some people down and some people up. Jesus is saying that we should work towards reconciliation with everyone. With everyone that we know. 
especially people that we don't like. Jesus says to look deeper and try harder and sacrifice a bit and walk in the shoes of the other person. That's harder. That's harder to do. And lastly, Jesus says the hardest part of faith. Jesus said it's not enough to love our families and our clans and our fellow Americans and our fellow Christians or our fellow Baptists or congregationalists for that matter. But that's the only thing, but that we need to even love our enemies. This is what separates us as a religion. This is what separates us as a people. No one else does this. No one else says, let's go take care of our enemies because I love them so much. Does that make any sense to you? That is crazy. It's like Martin Luther King's famous quote from Loving Your Enemy when he says, returning hate for hate multiplies hate, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Jesus is saying for us to do the hardest thing we possibly can because it's the only effective tool that changes things. Jesus wants us to live by God's law, but he wants us to live it in our hearts. Jesus wants us to live into the law of love in a natural, easy way. He doesn't want us to be burdened under the weight of sin every day of our lives so that we're miserable. Jesus doesn't want that. Jesus wants us to be joyful. Oh, I've reestablished relationships with people I was at odds with. I had a guy in my church and he was dying of cancer. And he admitted to me, I've done some bad stuff in my life. He had about a year to live. So you know what he did? He said, I think I'm actually going to go out and talk to the people I've heard. He's lived in Vermont all his life. And so all his friends, of course, still lived here, right? And so he went out and he'd have lunch with people he hadn't talked to in 30 and 40 years. And he'd say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I did this to you. He said, not only did it free him, but it freed them as well, because they were holding on to this anger of how he treated them. And so it healed both parties. It had a dramatic effect. Jesus wants us to live that way, because that's the way we were made. We were made to be good. We know the behaviors. We just have to claim them and make them our own. And brothers and sisters, that's how the church grows. That's how the church grows. When we stop getting angry and demanding our way and seeking money over meaning and focusing on ourselves and treating others in ways we don't want to be treated and living out a theology of scarcity instead of abundance, we all know some of the negative behaviors that go on in churches, right? I've been a minister for 35 years. I know some of the church meetings that would knock your socks off. <laughs> Meetings where few folks slam the door on the way out, never to be seen again, because somebody said something mean and nasty to them, whether it was true or not. And you all chuckled at that, so I know you have meetings like we do. Who cares what the color of the ladies' room is? But when people come in that door and they see a community where kindness and goodness is as natural as walking down the aisle, that's what draws people here. If they come in and they see Mary in the back corner arguing with somebody about, I want these cookies and they're not here, Mary, that's not really what you said, but... If they come in instead and say, oh, those cookies were so good. Thank you for the effort of bringing them out. That's what draws people to church. This is an alternative vision of the world. We are ethical people. We are kind people. We have love that spreads over and abundant all over the place. That's who Jesus calls us to be. And when we do that, churches will grow. Amen? Now, I do something that Karen doesn't do. Any questions? She said you would not ask a question, so I'd love... Yes, Sarah, yes! I wasn't going to... 
Jesus said in the question read from the Attitudes and that Jesus was, do you think that sealing a handkerchief by the Virgin in 1971 is that equivalent to murder, or is that part of what Jesus was trying to do in the Sermon on the Mount to say it's more about the inner workings of the heart and motivations than about specific sin and the murder they are? I love people that answer their own questions. Yes, I would agree with that. Uh, ranking sins gets to be a little tricky. Um, one of the greatest sins that is neglected of the Ten Commandments, people working too much. Seven days. It kills your spirit. That law came about before the Ten Commandments was even given. It's really the first commandment we get from our God. It's it's put in the Ten Commandments, but back before, when they're going out into out of Egypt, they're going out to get a day of rest. And so some people just say, ah, they blow that off and they work seven days and they don't think a thing of it. But you're really killing yourself. So I don't rank sins, but I do think that in, in the Beatitudes and the Ten Commandments, taking care of your heart and your head and getting in right order there will feed out and take care of you of all the sins. You won't do any of them. And so Jesus wasn't saying that there were sins and there were sins, that they were all equivalent in the say the Ten Commandments. Yeah, I, I don't know of any scripture text that rank that where Jesus ranks the sins. Um, the, t the, the time Jesus gets the most angry is that the Jewish leadership who takes the law and twists it to their own advantage. Like uh, Jesus, it's a famous, it's it's called the woe narratives. Woe to you. You know, that, that little series of texts. Jesus is angry. And so the only unforgivable sin in scripture is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And so the way I interpret that is when you use God for your own purpose, right? That's what makes God and Jesus, I think, matter than anything. Um, if you look, if, if you look at that, but is 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 not observing the Sabbath a worse sin than murder? I don't know. Murder seems really, really bad. And yeah, so but 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 there's no ranking. I've I've never seen a ranking. So we do the ranking because our sin is okay, but their sin is one step too far. Okay, I'll stop with that. Any other questions? Thank you. I'm so glad we had if we could have one more, that would really be fantastic. Oh, Steve, babe, man. Okay, fine. Amen. Fine. Now we're going to take the offering again. <laughs> Not really. I'm kidding. Now Sarah is going to come up and do uh, opportunities for service. So most of this is in your bulletin this morning, but I'll just uh, emphasize that there's a sign-up sheet on the round table for the ice skating party. That's next Sunday afternoon. And there's a good group already signed up, so uh, add your name. Uh, second um, sign-up sheet that's back there, actually two sign-up sheets for the baked potato lunch. Um, there's one sheet for you to simply say that you're coming and how many in your in your group. And the other is if you wish to make a donation of some of the toppings, there's a place for you to do that. So please do that today because, again, this is next week, right after church. Um, then we have the, the usual activities that happen most every week. We're uh, in the midst of our winter book group reading of Freeing Jesus by Diana Butler Bass. And um, the Bible study is every Monday in person and on Zoom at 1130. 
the coffee hour, which so many of us enjoy, is on Thursday mornings on Zoom at 9.30. It's just a very informal time for catching up with church news and things going on in the world and chit-chatting. Low-key, very nice. And... Um, the one great hour of sharing special offering has been mentioned, so I won't say that again. Um, but I did want to report, some of you will have heard that the baptistry project has finally been largely accomplished this week. And this has been easily a year in process. And Frank Swayze has been dogging this from the beginning right down until Friday. And I think there's a little bit more to do. So I think we really ought to thank Frank especially for his efforts. And also Dave Little, Cindy Little, and Adam helped out around the edges of, of the project. So we thank all of them, and we look forward to having a baptism soon. Uh, be sure to join us for refreshments after the service in the back. Thanks to Cindy and Dave. Thank you. Will you now please join me for the closing hymn in Christ There Is No East or West, number 600. <laughs>